Um, sorry. Uh, excuse me. Um, Marco, do you mind introducing the, uh, um, I've just got to get my, do you mind introducing the guest critics, please? I, I don't, sorry, I'm just in too many different, <laughs> not prepped for this, hold on a second. I've lost my Zoom window. Sorry, I was there. I was still on mute there. Yeah, let me just, uh, I'll do that for you now. Um, just waiting for that file to open. <laughs> it doesn't want to open. That's great. Um, bear with me. Okay, here we go. All right, so. Um, um, I will uh, introduce our guest critics this morning and then I will let Cheryl take over from there. Um, so with us this morning, we have Viola Ago and Timothy Mitnitis. Viola is an architectural designer, educator, and practitioner. She directs Miracles Architecture and is the current Wortham Fellow at the Rice University School of Architecture in Houston, Texas. Viola has also held the Christos Yesios Visiting Professorship at the Knowlton School of Architecture at Ohio State University and the William Muschenheim Design Fellowship position at the Taubman College of Architecture at the University of Michigan. Viola has previously taught, previously taught at Harvard uh, GSD, Rhode Island School of Design, and the Southern California Institute of Architecture. She earned her Master of Architecture degree from the Southern California Institute of Architecture in Los Angeles and a Bachelor of Architectural Science from Ryerson University in Toronto. So welcome back, Viola. Uh, prior to teaching, Viola worked as a lead designer in the advanced technology team at Morphosis Architects in Los Angeles. Welcome. Uh, Timothy Mitnitis is an architect and founding principal of Creative Union Network, a team of diverse collaborators from a variety of disciplines. The office works across a range of project types and scales, including condos, houses, landscapes, objects, restaurants, and workplaces, many of which have been published in the Globe and Mail and Toronto Life magazine. Timothy is a graduate of Ryerson University's Bachelor of Architectural Science and Master of Architecture programs, where he was part of our first ever Master of Architecture cohort. Uh, between completing his undergraduate and graduate degrees, Timothy also worked in the office of UN Studio. So welcome back to you too, Tim. And thank you both for, uh, for joining us uh, this morning. So Cheryl, I'll now turn it over to you to, uh, to master of ceremonies the, uh, the presentation. Apologies, everyone. I'm sorry I, I have, was not uh, prepared for this time. Um, so welcome to Amira Teori's uh, M4 thesis presentation. And uh, the title of his uh, thesis is The Formal Operation of Architecture, The Question of Abstraction. You'll have 20 minutes to present, Amir, and uh, we'll follow with questions and commentary. So please proceed. Thank you. The Formal Operation of Architecture, The Question of Abstraction. The main intention of this thesis is to address one central question. How can architecture communicate through the forms it creates? It is important to clarify the term formal operation. In this thesis, formal operation is specifically refers to the process in which forms, three-dimensional volumes, and shapes are created in architecture. The term form also refers to the underlying syntax of language, both the verbal language and the language of art, the underlying structuring systems, and conceptual models in general. However, the emphasis on the more reductive understanding of the term form serves a particular purpose in this thesis. The non-physical three-dimensional volumes and their visible extracted shapes create a category of abstract entities that the audience of architecture have an immediate access to. This category is the surface or the starting point of what is supposed to be communicated between the author and the audience. Therefore, the possibility of communicating meaning through a formal process is the central concern in this thesis. Theoretic, theoretical frameworks such as materialism, functionalism, and phenomenology, which glorify the idea of real and the thing in itself, have been deliberately set aside as an attempt to locate the position of the thesis with regards to the communicative capacity of architecture. The reason behind it is the following proposition. 
If architecture is to communicate in a way that is analogous to language, it needs to operate through its abstract constituents, rather than contingent materialized ent entities. In other words, it needs to operate through entities that belong to our cognition and cultural milieus, rather than, supposed, rather than the supposed reality. Communicative capacity here refers to how architecture can intellectually engage with its audience and allow for the possibility of meaningful interpretations. This requires us to view human subjects as first and foremost thinking beings rather than mere bundles of desires. One can broaden the scope of communication to include all of our bodily senses, thinking that the act of smelling flowers and the touching of stone are forms of communication in their own right. But this metaphorical use of the term communication has been of no interest in this thesis. The main preoccupation with a form of communication that is analogous to language is something that this thesis shares with many familiar and well-established theories in art and architecture. Both the classical and modern formalism, structuralism, and Eisenman's early interest in the question of syntax are all instances of such theories. However, these frameworks either address the question of meaning in a symbolic manner or deliberately set aside the question of meaning to instead fo focus on the construct of formal operation itself. The latter case, creates a vacuum of signification. In effect, the audience is given the task of reading up to the under, underlying syntax. How can a formal process be semantically motivated if the starting point of the process is itself meaningless? Such formalist approaches follow the logic of whole to parts. This whole is a conceptual blueprint which generates formal fragments. This blueprint is an a priori conceptual matrix which only signifies itself and is not concerned with concepts and meanings that are external to it. In order to break free from this vacuum of signification, a method emerges in the thes thesis that privileges fragments over whole, with the hope of readdressing the question of meaning in a non-symbolic manner. Therefore, this transition can be thought of as a shift from the logic of whole to part to part to whole. One might inquire about the difference between the proposed framework and other approaches that similarly privileges fragments over whole. For example, the work of Carlos Scarpa comes to mind in this respect. The answer is the differences between the nature of the fragments themselves. The abstract constituents of the fragments in other frameworks is still following an a priori logic just in a smaller scales. In other words, the same dilemma of self-referentiality that one is facing creating a totalizing form of strategy still persists when the scale shifts to the level of detail. However, fragments in this thesis refers to perceptual fragments, in other words, mental images. When it comes to this perspectival construct, another set of abstract constituents that are specific to the perspective drawing emerges. For example, one can think of abstract properties such as the degree of distortion, the number of the number and position of vanishing points, the angle of converging lines, and the degree of overlap. These properties do not follow an a priori logic, but rather respond to, your, to, to the architect's interpretation of how a particular external concept can be manifested in the mental image. This, the subjective window through which the forms are constructed and viewed is used as an analytical tool in Venturi's complexity and contradiction in architecture. The ambiguity that Venturi celebrates is the ambiguity of visual perception. For example, in Venturi's words, the facade of the cathedral at Mercia employs what has been called inflection to promote largeness, yet a smallness. Or Sohn's museum employs a vestigial element in another dimension. The partition in the form of suspended arches defines the rooms at once open and closed. The tower of Christ's church is a manifestation of both and at the scale of the city. The tower is both a wall and a tower. This semantic association of concepts, such as largeness, openness, and centrality, with the perceptual fragments is the key in addressing the question of meaning in architecture. However, Venturi's approach is analytical, and the perspective and snapshots are analytical tools responding to an already designed project. For these fragments to be generative in the formal process, they need to operate as signs and indexes. Clearly, architects often use perspective drawings and sketches during the design process. However, it is mostly used as an explanatory or complementary tool to test the effect of a design proposal as seen from a particular vantage point. This tendency in its extreme form can also become a fetish, a mere preoccupation with the picturesque values of architectural products. Note the distinction between white picturesque project on the right and Woolly Park on the left. In the case of Woolley Park, the architect is concerned not with characteristics and composition in the picturesque sense of the word, 
but with what Colin Rowe calls the typical. It aspires to an ideal or a system. Using Saussure's diachronic and synchronic axes, we can investigate how architectural fragments on the diachronic axis be generated from the vertical conceptual matrix. This is a common approach in formats and structures frameworks. However, the focus has always been on the relationship between gener generative grammar and the science. The question is whether this, this diagram can be drawn with respect to the architectural fragments as indexes and to establish the relationship not to the underlying syntax, but to a set of external concepts, a diagram analogous to levi strauss study of myths. Roland Barthes applies this diagram in his, analysis, in his analysis of narrative structures in cinema. The perceptual fragments are used effectively in cinema. They are put together consequentially to form a narrative. They are set in motion to create an illusion of temporality. However, Roland Barthes ca categorizes these fragments to those that serve the plot diachronically and those that, that stand alone having a vertical and atemporal quality, revealing the discourse of the author and the subject matter. He calls the former category distributional and the latter integrative. These indexical fragments do not serve an overarching plot, but rather make metaphoric associations to the axis of selection. Modernist cinema is a good example where the focus is on the integrative function as opposed to the plot. The plot is reduced to subplots, allowing the scenes to serve poetically the overall discourse of each film. However, we must note the ontological distinction between cinema and architecture. Perceptual fragments or snapshots in cinema are constructed, but they are at the, at the end photographic and taken from a real setting. For these fragments to be useful and generative in architecture, we should think of, think of them as ideal mental images. The idea of mental images can be explored in the form of perspective drawing in architecture. Certain qualities of modern perspective drawing can be instrumental during the formal process. Panofsky's historical analysis of perspective drawing demonstrates how the shift from the pre-Renaissance perspective construction to the modern method was not merely driven by the desire to represent reality from a human eye as faithful as possible. But more importantly, the modern perspective construction transformed the world into an undifferentiated mathematical plane. Therefore, the rational perspective is an ideal image, a calculated image. It has two major qualities which distinguish it from other forms of drawings. First, despite its rationality and objectivity, more than any other drawings, it allows for subjectivity. Secondly, by definition, a perspective drawing more than other drawings only exposes a fragment and it omits the rest. In other words, it depicts parts of an idea which is distorted by subjective viewpoint and it leaves out what is hidden. Therefore, this game of giving and withholding visual information resists a totalizing picture of an architectural form. In doing so, it depicts an idea from a subjective window and it leaves what is not shown open to reinterpretation. Here, reinterpretation refers simply to the capacity of imagining what forms can occupy the areas that a perspective drawing hides. Perspective can be rationally drawn from a known specific form. This is done with the aid of other orthographic projections. The reverse construction is also plausible. However, this time around, the series of ideal perspectives will amount to an unknown whole. These drawings demonstrate how a perspective of a disorderly environment can be translated into three-dimensional volumes. One question needs to be addressed. How can an architect resist unifying the semantic fragments into a central concept? since his or her subjectivity is itself unified. To avoid this, a quotational method can be applied, a strategy borrowed from literature, particularly novels. In this method, the author essentially speaks through subject types. Each character responds to an external concept. In doing so, the richness and the multiplicity of meanings that are rooted in an architectural project will not be subsumed by a premature synthesis of concepts into one. The following points demonstrate the terms and conditions of the proposed design method. Number one, deconstruct the subject matter into smaller concepts. Suspend the presumption of unity. Assign fictitious subject to each concept. Number two, an image is produced by the subject through his or her interpretation of the concept. Number three, manifest manifestations of images 
differ even though the concepts are the same. This is because subjects use the same concepts but interpret them differently. Number four, the case for venture is both and. The law of non-contradiction can be resisted if and only if A and non-A are two different interpretations of two separate subjects. Subjects are not visitors witnessing a preconceived environment. They construct their ideal images based on their responses to external concepts. There are two categories of forms under construction, forms that house the characters and forms that, that the characters are looking at. This method is not concerned with what lies completely outside of one's perception. In other words, forms created must at least have one leg involved with the perspectives. Perspectives are relational and therefore perspectives that involve a subject's imagination that does not respond to another character's imagination are discarded. Therefore, perspectives involve subjects looking at each other's conditions and what lies in between. The visual information given in one imagination must appear in another. It is only the misinformation from one perspective that is up to reinterpretation by another subject. The author might give more weight to some personas than others. However, this is not necessary. Number five, the resulting forms generated with the aid of mental images begin to combine. The synthesis comes from contradicting perspectives. The final synthesized form needs to satisfy a multitude of perspectives. To illustrate the relational aspect of fragments in this framework, suppose a scenario in which subject one creates the corresponding environment. Subject two, with the knowledge of subject one's mental image, manifests his or her fragment. So forms are perpetually created through each subject responding to another subject interpretation. In order to fully test the proposed framework, the method has been exercised with regards to the subject matter of the School of Architecture. This is a conceptual project and is not designed for occupancy. The resulted architectural elements perpetually combine to establish an architectural formal narrative about the School of Architecture. There are four fictitious character types established in this project. First character, subject one, is a student assigned to the concept of learning. Subject two is a professor who is responding to the concept of teaching. And subject three is a member of the public. And subject four is a conventional architect. Subject three and four both respond to the concept of critique. Following the proposed method, the concept of a school of architecture first is deconstructed into smaller concepts. School of architecture falls under the broader category of educational institutions and can be devised into the three main concepts of teaching, learning, and critique. There is no objective condition for the extraction of these three concepts apart from the fact that they exist as a cluster in our collective consciousness. Or more accurately, they belong to the same synchronic category. Each, sub each subject interprets their assigned concepts differently and forms a proposition based on the institutional role they play. For four additional concepts will emerge which function as representatives of these interpretations. The resulted con concepts are order, disorder, appearance, and reality. By way of analogy, you can imagine a room where four characters are sitting around a table constructing their fragments of a school of architecture. There is no pre-established diachronic sequence in this project, meaning the project can be entered from any of the four characters. The following video demonstrates one possible diachronic sequence.
In a word, the bourgeoisie creates a world in its image. Comrades, we must destroy that image. Un marxista come lei trae tanto spesso ispirazione da soggetti che escono dal Vangelo o dalle testimonianze. I would not be for fashion in architecture. I would look for more profound. This is not about reality. The underlying reality is more of an organic than a mechanical sort. No, Gustav. No. Beauty belongs to the senses. Only to the senses. You cannot reach the spirit. You cannot reach the spirit through the senses. An idea comes, and you see it, and you hear it, and you know it. How does it come? It comes like on a TV in your mind. <laughs> These are the orthographic drawings of the final object in its totality. First, a comprehensive plan showing all the significant levels at once. The elevation of the west wing manifested by the professor. The elevation of the south wing manifested by the public member. Section through the gallery and the crit space, looking at the world of the professor. Section through the gallery and the crit space, looking at the world of the student. One significant question remains. If the method ensures the production of formal fragments that operate like words and language, does, does the method also provide an alternative syntax? In other words, rules of combination. The answer to this question again lies in the very idea of human subjectivity. A form of subject-dependent syntax constantly emerges from one project to another. As our cultural understandings evolve and our semantic underpinnings of our concepts change, the way subject combined formal fragments into a meaningful whole also evolve. Thank you. Thank you, Amir. Well, we'll proceed then with um, questions of clarification and then move to comments. Any questions? Yeah, there's a few. Um, Amir, um, you spoke about uh, two blocks and of course the, the central um, zone of the student. There's a, another block that you didn't discuss, which is sort of opposite the professor's block. Is that part of the student realm as well? Your your um, uh, microphone is muted. Sorry. Yes. Uh, sorry. What what section of the object you were talking about? The the there are three blocks. You spoke about the professor's block, the public block, which has holds the critique space, but there's a third one on the right of the plan. Is that simply part of the student zone? Because it's not shown when you indicate the diagram for the, the student zone. Uh, so that belongs to uh, that belongs to uh, the fourth character. So before the fourth four character applies his interpretation on the project, of uh, the professor offices and a student. So what the fourth character does, it brings everything together. And so with that orientation, that atrium-like uh, space creates, and he completes uh, and resolves the, the other parts of the design, adding the demarcation on the north side and adding that block on the side. So that's behind the interpretation oh. of the student, but the typical architect resolves the whole complex okay. in, in, in a more materialized, synthesized way. Uh, introducing the bridges between the worlds, introducing that uh, uh, um, resolution space in the atrium uh, uh, at that entrance behind the students. So that belongs to the, uh, that part. Okay. Um, two, uh, two other questions. You um, start off by being very clear about um, the real and the thing in itself 
um, rejecting that. Um, and interestingly, there's a, a short little fragment uh, almost at the very end um, in all those quotations that talks about an underlying reality. So I, I, I'd like to um, perhaps is just clarifying what you mean in rejecting the real is rejecting a kind of reductive understanding of reality that that focuses more on um, the physical. Uh, yes, so a form of subjective idealism uh, has always been a bias or a predisposition of this thesis. It's not rejecting per se, but setting aside the, uh, the concern for materialism and the thing in itself. Instead of appreciating the forms uh, as what they are, uh, it is about how can, how can they operate as signed indexes. And in this thesis, they're not grammar signs, but there are indexes that can hopefully connect to an external meaning or a concept on a synchronic axis. So uh, the, the investigation and the intention doesn't end by the object and the material in itself, but what can be, what can be said, well, how can it operate signed to reference something outside of itself? Um, and that's yes. the preparation for your um, focus on the abstract and, and mental images. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Let's follow up on the first question, Amir, about the uh, that mystery block that showed up on the right-hand side of the drawing. Um, yes. If I understand correctly from your description or explanation, it, it never exists as a perceptual fragment like the others do. Is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. Not in the... Uh, yes. Okay, so if that's the architect's perception or the architect's contribution to this uh, assemblage, does that put the architect in a position of omniscience? Well, the architect, uh, all, all, always, always, the architect always sees the whole picture? Uh, to, to some degree. So he, he's one of the characters in this framework and um, so all the characters respond to interpretation of another character and the assigned task of a typical architect is concerned with the critique in the sense of synthesis. So he is, uh, he's uh, charged with the task of bringing the opposing views together in a materialized manner. So uh, that's why one of the strategies assigned to, uh, one of the strategies that he's done is adding that block plus the bridges and plus that demarcation of the uh, casual crit space, atrium space in the middle of um, all the other characters. So if you imagine a Venn diagram with three different opposing views or opposing worlds, this intersection of that Venn diagram is, is the perspective of the typical architect. Because in your document, you took some pains to distinguish between the architect character and the architect author. Yes, right. the author, I called myself the author to set up the architectural narrative. So that was for clarification that the tip, because uh, because of the typology, a typical architect is one of the characters, but I who designed the whole thing uh, called uh, myself an author without a prejudgment of these characters just to set up the narrative, set up the room for a conversation. Okay, thanks. Maybe I can ask a couple of questions as well. It's sort of, um, I mean, it's all um, kind of related to some of the previous questions, um, but, um, and they might not be answerable questions, but I want to make sure that I understand the sort of intention uh, behind some of the moves in the project. Um, so this idea of, um, uh, and maybe I missed this, but the, um, this, what I read as a sampling component, um, where especially in the student's perspective, um, where you have a kind of like a sphere, um, a staircase that uh, wraps around the sphere, a kind of bridge, um, some other types of um, spaces that are neither large nor small, um, uh, facade elements that have been um, sort of delaminated from building components and all these types of um, um, architectural elements. Is there a kind of strategy in this idea of sampling? Do they come from, from a particular um, library of things? Or is that just something that um, in a way you're kind of setting up a prototype for and you could easily replace them with other elements? Or what's, your, what's the kind of uh, thinking behind that? Yes, for, for that mental image, it was more important to me 
for, for that section to say disorder rather than objectively manifest disorder. So, and for that, I, I've used what we have inherited in our consciousness from architecture, the language of Russian constructivism and so forth, to, to imagine, imagine an environment that, that can efficiently communicate disorder. So the uniqueness of those forms, they're, they're not rep repetitious, the disorienting uh, uh, of their rotations, just helping to, gi to give out the impression of a disorderly environment. So it is that element to the uniqueness of the forms, the discreteness of them, uh, but the impression of the, of the circulation to be deliberately confusing, uh, all for the sake of communicating uh, um, an impression of a disor disorderly environment the st student is imagining. And maybe, so that was my second question that I have here, this idea of disorder. Um, I'm wondering if, um, because um, when I think of disorder, for instance, and this is something that actually I've been working with um, here and there for, for um, a little bit of time now in terms of like design research. Um, when I think of the idea of disorder um, um, and my um, kind of own subjectivity, um, if I think about it through architectural terms or um, formal operations or um, even kind of like visual, like 2D visual analysis of formal operations and so on, um, I would think of things being um, completely um, kind of like to a much higher degree of disorder, let's call it for, for an instance, for, uh, for a minute. So um, I wouldn't, uh, my idea of disorder would be to not have any floor plates, for instance, um, so, something that like does not actually have any horizontality at all, for example. So I'm wondering if this idea of, I'm wondering essentially like how um, you're qualifying disorder um, and is it just a measure against a grid, like an I-square grid, or um, is it a measure against like um, um, floor slab levels or construction grids and so on? Um, and is that, and again, like I'm kind of wondering if this is, if we are to see this as a kind of prototype um, where things can be swapped out for something else. Um, right, does that, does that, yes. I, I don't know. Yes, uh, you're absolutely right because um, again, if I were to manifest disorder in an objective manner, an environment that promises a life of disorder, it might not look this way. But it was more important to me uh, to recognize, as you said, the, uh, the, the move against the grid, the move against that, is it is an outdated strategy of cranking what you know, what you perceive of, what order can be manifest in the architecture. So you revolt against it. And of course, this form of revolt against it of cranking and forms or disorienting is not, uh, is not a new idea of the story of manifesting architecture, but it is an idea that we can easily communicate from its surface. So, um, it, it, so if it, this was built as a proposal for environment the student can, can study in, it doesn't promise a life or an environment of disorderly or creativity, but the imagination fragment promises a communication of uh, creativity. And it might be uh, regarded as unethical to think that way, but it is ethical in, in a sense, from my view, that it is important for this art of it to say and to communicate rather than promise a life of. So that's how I, um, uh, I would respond to that, yes. Okay, and I have one final question uh, and then <laughs> I'll stop. Um, the, the final, um, composition or um, kind of um, um, conglomerating the four perspectives, the four subjectivities together, um, however you want to refer to them. Um, it is completely orthogonal um, in the sense that you have the kind of like the four sides of a cube. You have like your, um, when I looked at that tabletop, all I could see is a kind of like um, X, Y plane coordinate with um, um, these things sort of like um, being placed on all four sides. Um, was there any type of like intentionality behind that? Or is that um, again, like one way of placing these perspectives together? Like, did you, did you ever think of them being linear, lin linearly placed together or um, in kind of like 360 space or anything like that? Um, uh, in, in the points that I explained for the design method, I intentionally put something there that it might limit uh, how these words um, floating in a spatial matrix come together and collide, it might limit it. 
but it, it also can add a, a, a clue of how they can be relational. So I put it there, how they have to respond to one another and how uh, one perspective needs to respond to another perspective. And that kind of uh, create that kind of subject dependent syntax that they accumulate to one another based on the angle of the view they're looking at. So in that way, in this project, they simply come together from that kind of um, uh, limitation of, of, the, of, the, uh, of the point. So because I, I just wanted to make sure that um, because it's the part to hold kind of a strategy, as they accumulate, they're not parallel universes without any connections because that could easily be the case. Mm -hmm. And no form of synthesis can arise from that apart from a conceptual one. But because of the character of the fourth character and, and, and the coming together of these pieces and words, I put that stipulation in the points that they need to be relational in a formal and conceptual uh, mode. So that's why they, in metaphorically, linearly, they come together like a Venn diagram in that sense. Great, thank you. That was my questions. I would like to ask a question about um, about the, the order of operations. I mean, I'm thinking in, in terms of the t temporality of, of, of each of the characters taking their um, proverbial kick at the can in terms of the design and how you organize your your concept in terms of why why it's that it takes that particular order and uh, if there's some justification or behind that and um, you know, how, how modification of that order, is it possible within your, your co design con construct or is this particular order uh, mandatory for to get the result that you need? Yes, I, my hope has always been to de-emphasize the premise of a diachronic sequence in any form. In movie, we understand it as plot in architecture. We sometimes understand it as uh, visitors and clients walking through a finished building. And the references to cinema, modern cinema, and, uh, and scenes that can stand alone, they are situated within a subplot, true, but their significant significance comes from their vertical uh, connection to synchronic axis, which is simultaneity, not a succession. So uh, th that's why I, I said there is no pre preconceived diachronic sequence. The video shows possibility um, uh, entering entering the sequence from the student perspective, um, but it, it can go from um, uh, any other perspective because these are not these are fictitious characters. And when I when I was imagining putting myself in the shoes of a persona of a student. Uh, or a professor or, or, or a public member is not as if that I'm uh, the, the characters are completely um, um, in dark with regards to other creations. They're simultaneously aware of other people's interpretations. That's why I made that metaphor of sitting around the table disputing and having a conversation. So, so if this, the student character, imagine the environment disorderly the professor responds with that demarc demarcating facade and respond with that Dionysian scheme to be the order. So th this could be reversed to they're at the same time talking, at the same time having a conversation. I did it this way just to emphasize and test the possibility of a synchronic uh, significance rather than a diachronic one. Because diachronic one, uh, it, 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 um, uh, it doesn't have it doesn't have that capacity to 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 uh, to uh, motivate the formal operation in, in a way that it should. Yes. So uh, I guess um, just in summary, just to make sure I'm understanding it. So all of the conceptions are meant to simultaneously exist and not exist while the construction, while exactly. the manifestation is happening. Exactly. Because of the bias that I have from, for instance, Levi-Strauss that whatever underpinning concepts we have exists in a cross section of our cultural milieu. So whether it's revolution order, whether it's theatrical performance consumption, they, they, they come after one another in a sentence construct, but as concepts, they, they exist in a cross section in our psyche. So that's why I wanted, okay, if that's the case, uh, these fragments, I, I, I was hoping to, to, stand, to have that stand alone, a temporal quality. Thank you.
<clears throat> there's a nice connection um, in the, the last two um, conversations between a linearity and um, disrupting that into uh, other forms. I mean, your um, explanation of the image of the table to um, uh, break any kind of um, formalization of, of perhaps a sequence in design is, is I think, extremely valuable. Um, at the same time, to come back to um, the suggestion of violas of, of a linear disposition for your scheme, you in fact include that um, as um, the diachronic sequences that you've referred to from time to time, because the experience of, of the project um, necessarily produces all of these per perhaps infinite uh, linear constructions. Um, while at the same time, at the other end, there is this um, extreme fluidity in the conversation around the table as you consider these. So um, that leads to um, a, a question about, if, can you summarize for you the role of designing with characters? Because that's a, that's a very, um, you know, clearly um, different proposition in, in your thesis compared to, you know, standard yes. design process. That's what, that was an attempt to be faithful to Venturi's idea of richness of meaning rather than the simplicity of meaning. Because the other form of this framework, for instance, Palladio and so forth, have an external concept. The last one was sublime, for instance. Back in the day, okay, virtue, and the whole thing is about virtue. Avoid that reduction and the simplicity and premacy of one external concept. I, I added the stipulation of let's borrow a strategy in novels, particularly in literary novels, where the complexity of various subject types, institutionalized types, come to the surface without a premature uh, synthesis. So that's that was what I was hoping. So of course we can we, when it when it comes to a subject matter a typology, you can have a big idea. A big idea doesn't have to be always formal and self-referential. A big idea could be a hope, could be an external concept. But I say that utopian reduction, that that utopian idea is simplistic and, and reductive. In order to uh, take the capacity of communicating uh, something in architecture that is rich, that it has contradiction, that has ambiguities in it systematically put the stipulation of having different characters. Uh, of course, these are not real characters, but the same way that an author uses it in, in literature instrumentally, we, we can use it in, um, in architecture instrumentally too. But it is important to not to mistake them as, as um, uh, clients or, or the users, because that would be reducing, uh, uh, reducing them to, to the scenario in which we have to satisfy their needs and so forth. This way, it is, it is the fictitious characters are there to consider a contradicting idea, opposing view that otherwise would have been subsumed much earlier during the process. So that was the intent, yes. Yeah, I think that uh, latter final distinction of yours that these are not clients is, is an important one because um, it, it can be read that they are clients um, in each and their kind of zone of the project but they're really subjectivities in your case. Yes. Mir, I wonder if we could uh, talk for a moment about the specific manifestation of some of these um, subjectivities and the way they are expressed in architectural terms. Um, I'm looking at the drawing now uh, and of the, of the kind of assemblage, and there are some clear references that are being made to um, you know, highly kind of recognizable architectural traditions or typologies. Um, and I'll be, you know, I'll, 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 I'll make it very dumb. Um, the, the student uh, uh, assemblage there, um, by and large, one could read as a kind of reference to deconstructivism. Um, you already referred to the, prof the professor's uh, uh, block as Mesian. Um, the monumental block that includes the presentation space that is open to the public um, has obviously also some some clear kind of references to particular architectural traditions 
Um, it's a kind of, uh, you know, classicizing uh, uh, form. It's, uh, you know, again, obviously conceived to be highly monumental. Uh, the drum is reminiscent of moves by, you know, people like Mario Bota. So there are recognizable elements. And then the architect's block is, is embodying certain aspects of Korb's architecture, certainly the strip window and the Peloti. And I'm just wondering what role this kind of associative meaning plays in your process. Is, is, are there deliberate references being made here that are legible to the trained uh, uh, reader that may not be legible to the casual observer? Is that an intentional kind of double meaning? Is, what role does that kind of architectural reading play in this project? Yes, um, that's true. I would call them sort of references allusions because um, it was important to me for them to allude to something that we already can recognize and, and they have baggages that come with them. And that was only for the efficiency of what's supposed to be communicated. And my hope will always been to communicate through forms and forms alone, but, uh, but operate in a mid ground between the conventional symbolism, for instance, take, take the statue of lion to mean this way or that way, that extreme and to extreme of complete abstraction where you have a, a, a personal uh, feeling of, of what, you're, uh, what you're exposed to. The mid ground was, was, uh, was a place that I operated where the forms that, uh, uh, where you have the liberty to operate with something that we already have in an arc of our consciousness, not symbolically per se, but, but in an illusionary way, way where uh, this is reminiscent of something that I, uh, that I uh, associated with this concept and that concept. That historicity is something that a lot of formalists might dispute, but I don't have a problem with that form of historicity. And I think it helps, it helps and it only, it only uh, 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 helps the communication uh, moving forward. And because otherwise uh, our archive of form for the purpose of meaningfulness is, is rather empty, uh, is, is rather appreciating things as things in themselves or, or judging things as uh, uh, how big the room is and how many tables I can put in there. But if, if, if we want to communicate through the language we have, the archive we have uh, in architecture in not a conventional symbolism, but in an open sim symbolic manner, uh, yes, I deliberately uh, use those allusions because I was, I was thinking of efficiency of communication. How can, how can something efficiently communicate disorder rather than uh, be completely a personal impulse? Maybe you can define what you mean by abstraction then. It, it seems to be more about um, disorder than abstraction. Since you are, I mean, you emphasize disorder at, at the outcome or at the, at the beginning of the um, description of the project and the conversation we're having now. Um, but the title of abstraction, I mean, you, you've barely abstracted these forms. I, I would agree with Marco that their allusions and their historicity is quite, um, is quite obvious. So it seems to be more about the semantics of form or the language of form than the abstraction of form. Yes, uh, but uh, I clarified at the beginning that the abstraction is a common denominator between all the approaches that I reference in formalism. The degree of abstraction, of course, uh, is, is different, but cat uh, categories of grammar, grammar, syntax, and organizational strategies all could be thought of as abstract uh, schematization, true. But there are different levels of uh, uh, abstraction. And in, in drawings, in architecture, we always deal with abstraction in different levels. But I have reached a particular level of abstraction uh, to a degree that the semantic association is not lost. That was the hope. Because further than that, all those illusions all, uh, will be subsumed by, by the process. So that's what I mean. And in general, emphasizing the quality of abstraction as opposed to the materialized entity was a clear cut distinction that I wanted to establish. So that's how I use abstraction to clarify the mode in which the whole discourse was placed upon. Yeah, it's an interesting question because uh, we use 
abstraction and architecture quite differently from the uh, common interpretation of it, which is to reference something that is non-physical uh, or, or non-concrete. And um, we can't escape that in, in architecture when we have a building because it's very much a, a, a physical reality um, there in front of us. And so abstraction in architecture tends to refer to a, um, like a modern minimalism. Um, and, and so uh, we, we don't really necessarily get to the standard interpretation of abstraction as idea away from the concrete. I think that maybe um, if I can offer another way to sort of look at um, um, abstraction through a kind of um, Warringer, um, um, Gestalt um, um, kind of images um, or um, maybe even I think like you referenced Arnheim in your um, in your thesis book, um, this idea of architecture as um, or architectural components or elements as events, um, as things that don't belong to that particular um, to the particular uh, kind of like drawing or the material um, manifestation of it, but that there was something else that happened prior to the thing that we're seeing. So I think in that sense, um, and I'm looking at the comprehensive plan um, at the moment, in that sense, like I can, um, I can see this idea of abstraction as something that describes um, elements that maybe existed in a different state at a prior architectural event. So the event itself, um, is what produced the architecture. Um, so the constructing of the perspective and so on. Um, and I think um, this idea of disorder is, um, is, is very much um, connected and kind of the idea of disorder actually, I think, or the concept of disorder, I think in a way cannot exist without abstraction. Um, because if we don't, um, if we don't understand that um, disorder is sort of reacting against something else, then we're missing the, um, the idea of the event in a way, or the idea of like the, the kind of diagram that um, predecesses the form or the final form. Um, if, it, I don't even know if you're referring to these as final, because to me, it seems like it's always kind of changing. Um, so that's also like another question. Um, but maybe um, um, if I kind of wanted to zoom out a little bit um, and sort of, um, I think we very briefly, I think you touched on this idea of um, reacting against like a, um, a prior um, style or a prior, a prior movement or whatever. Um, so I'm, I'm still, I'm very much interested in this, um, in the sense of delaminating disorder, uh, reconstructing things, um, the fragment. Um, uh, my sense is that our kind of, um, our architectural discourse is also fragmented in the sense that we don't have that, um, what we used to have, which was sort of like a unified vision of like, okay, now we're in the kind of um, uh, the modernism period. Now we're in the postmodernism period. Now we're in this. And and um, um, my my kind of my, my senses are, I guess, like the thing that I keep going back and forth um, is this idea of um, how is this different from um, decon or is there, are we going through a kind of like neo decon period um, in a way? And my, I keep going back to this idea of the author, which is actually, um, uh, maybe not author actually, more the idea of fiction. So how you're using fiction or how you're building these fictitious um, uh, kind of storylines, uh, whether they're uh, linearly placed or orthogonally placed or um, what have you. So I think it's, um, for me, the success of the thesis is, 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 is in the fiction component um, of building fictitious worlds um, and the simultaneity of like the ordered, the disordered and the multiple subjectivities and, and so on. Um, and I think that's a really, really interesting response to our kind of fragmented, um, uh, non-unified way that we're, um, working through architectural problems, be it in practice, academia, and so on. So I think this kind of like pluralistic approach is, is a very interesting way of breaking the chain of style and then the anti-style or the, the reaction against like the previous style, the kind of the, the, the sort of like killing the father um, reference in, in the art discipline and so on. So I think this, this way of breaking the ontological frames, flattening it all to this idea of like fiction and subjectivity is really, really interesting. 
You're absolutely right. Uh, uh, I just need to respond to because it's important. Um, first of all, what you said about that state referencing Arnheim. Uh, yes, um, for me, whether it's correct or not, uh, everything that belongs to our cognitive environment, I call it abstract, and, we should, uh, and, the, uh, and I believe it to be abstract. That's about the idealism part of it. But the later comments, um, there is, uh, I just don't want it to be confusion, the difference between the decon and, and this. Um, there is this uh, alignment, uh, and it is by accident, uh, alignment between the perspective of a student in this specific project and my approach at large. And you call it the disorderly environment of a student disorderly, and the whole project is also fragmented in such a way, true. But it is important that there is a difference of uh, approach because at the end, uh, when the, in the animation, when I put the whispers there to poetically align with the attitude of these personas, uh, the student, uh, the bourgeoisie creates a worse in the image and we must destroy that. That is not my voice. That is my voice, but it is voice of the character I designed. Um, uh, because contradict to that is the voice of Mies and the vo voice of um, uh, Gustav and Alfred in Visconti's Death in Venice, talking about the virtue of art and beauty and so forth. Fragmentation and deconstruction, and that's part of the reason the formalist approach is always susceptible to be politically agnostic. Uh, that's true, even though they have the look of revolution, but they are politically agnostic at the end of the day. Why? Because to me, they forgot the question of meaning. But um, uh, yes, the approach is there are a lot of alignment with deconstructivism and, and Eisenman's are the interests and so forth, true. But the added elements of meaning allowed me to bring voice, significant voices to the table that are politically significant, but through the subjects and through the characters. So if the revolutionary aspect of the student is not the whole story, it's not the single concept rooted in the rich school of architecture we're dealing with. We uh, we, we have the perspective of the professor, which is not suppressed. It came to the table. So that's, uh, I use the fragmentary element not to subverse for the sake of subversion, but I want to use the flat, fragmentary element because it allows me to charge them semantically much earlier during the process before it's too late. Before, before the fragments are following the golden section, I want to charge them with meaning. So that, that, was, that was the intention, yes. Are there, um, I, I guess we're nearing the end of the, the time. Um, are there any further uh, comments or wrap up comments from? I would just like to say that um, the uh, last ex exchange is, is um, um, exactly what we uh, would hope for. It's why the final reviews are called a final defense. So um, thank you, Amir, for uh, um, actually defending your ideas and, and, and your thesis. Um, that was absolutely delightful. Um, and uh, I can see with Vi Viola smiles that um, that was a wonderful exchange. So um, thank you for uh, this exhilarating session today, and also thank you for a, a wonderful year. It's been absolutely remarkable working with you as you've been developing this, because it's um, um, yeah, obvious that you understand all of the references, the very um, wide-ranging and complex references that you've um, um, brought into this argument for looking at uh, meaning and communication in architecture through formal abstraction and formal operations. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, everybody. And I can't thank enough John and Marco, of course, and Cheryl and Elaine for all the uh, comments and all the external uh, uh, external guests for uh, wonderful uh, critiques and comments. Uh, thank you very much. It was uh, it was yeah. very uh, precious. Amir, Amir, I just want. Yeah, I just want to add to Amir that, uh, as John said, it's been really terrific working with you over the past year. And I also want to compliment you on um, your ability to get everything across, I think, very successfully in that video. Um, and I know that at times during the process, it's been hard to communicate some of these ideas because of their density and complexity. And I would say with each, with each subsequent milestone, it's gotten clearer. And I would say even between the submission of the document 
uh, you know, 10 days ago in the presentation has been, you know, one, again, a further step into that kind of concision and clarity. So you've done a very good job, I think, of, of synthesizing and, and, um, and presenting ideas that are extremely complex. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. That was really fantastic work. Thank, thank you, Amir. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I guess uh, we'll have you leave the meeting now and we'll confirm. Okay, I'll just leave? Okay. Yes, and I'll speak to you in a few minutes. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll say goodbye as